now it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker tonight, Dr. John Marsliff. Dr. Marsliff is the James W. Ridgway Professor of Wildlife Science at the University of Washington. He did his PhD at Northern Arizona University and his initial postdoc work at University of Vermont, uh, where his research is focused on the social behavior and ecology of jays and ravens. He is a prolific scientist. He has mentored over 40 graduate students and authored over 140 scientific papers on various aspects of bird behavior and wildlife management. His current research focuses on the interactions of ravens and wolves in Yellowstone, which we will hear about today. And in addition to all of his research and teaching work, Dr. Marslov has written five books, including Welcome to Suburbia, which I'm sure many of you have heard of, and that covers how suburbs can host incredible biodiversity and uh, what we can do to benefit birds and ourselves. His most recent book, In Search of Meadowlarks, connects our agriculture and diets to the conservation of birds and other wildlife. So Dr. Marsloff has this great body of work and we are very excited to host him today uh, to hear about some of that. So um, Dr. Marsloff, thank you so much for joining us and I will go ahead and hand it over to you. You bet, Serena, thanks for the invitation and thanks everybody for joining in to uh, listen to a little bit about ravens and wolves and people. Uh, this work is new research that's going on, so um, a lot of what you'll see is kind of in-progress stuff, uh, but I hope you'll get a feel for the sort of things we do and we're able to learn uh, with this, this work today. Well, I really want to focus on the interactions between uh, this really incredible, in this really incredible ecosystem that includes lots of people and our human activities there, but also uh, a full complement of carnivores uh, grizzlies and wolves and pumas and the scavenging guild of coyotes and foxes and ravens that associate with them. Let me start kind of broad and talk a little bit about how these uh, ravens have influenced our culture over the years. Tony Angel and I wrote a book about this several years ago now, and this is an image that Tony did uh, to help illustrate this process. We basically see the relationship between Corvids in general, but especially ravens and people as a coevolutionary one, where they've influenced our culture, our behaviors have influenced their behaviors or their culture uh, in return. And you see that as an arc through time that Tony has drawn here with initially the, the scavengers being here with predators before humans, and then, then uh, scavenging from us as we were more hunter and gatherer um, people. And, and influencing our culture in many ways, lots early in our histories, influencing the beliefs of many of our indigenous people here on the Pacific coast that view the raven as a creator or a trickster, and on through European and Asian cultures, uh, early American cultures, uh, European cultures here that uh, sought to keep uh, ravens away from scavenging from their food or their, their dead. Uh, that, that viewed them as important um, illustrators of social activities as the Asians uh, did in Japan, for example, uh, celebrating their pair bonds and the, the social grouping that they have. And on through the modern time when they played a role in our movies and um, sports teams, rock bands, names, and, and all sorts of different ways they influence our culture. I always uh, kind of revert back to the idea that whenever you hear a crow or a raven call on a on a film, you know something bad's gonna happen after that because we view them now mostly as an omen of, of, of ill will or death impending as opposed to the creative uh, energy that we got from them earlier in our interactions. Well, ravens are, I, I would argue, are um, absolutely one of the most adaptable species on this planet. They live from the high Arctic, the high mountains, on down to the lowest deserts. And you've got them all throughout California in all that range of habitat. Areas where people dominate the land and areas where nature uh, dominates the land still. And just as an example, uh, here's the graph of raven numbers from Christmas bird count data. I see you're gonna get a talk on that next. Well, here's some use of those data to show the increase in ravens over time. This is in the state of Montana, but it, the curve looks exactly the same for California and Washington and all of the West, in fact with an exponential rise in, in ravens over the last several decades. So I wanna talk about that a bit as we go through and learn how they uh, basically act as a species. 
how they interact with people and other uh, predators in the uh, Yellowstone ecosystem as an example, and then how this rise in numbers has led uh, some to be concerned about the role of ravens. Um, for example, in your uh, area, not far from you, as predators on the desert tortoise in the Mojave. So let me first start with, with how ravens came to be in, in this land, and a lot of that has to do with the connections that have waxed and waned between the old and new world uh, through Beringia, the land connections between Asia, uh, the far, far East, and uh, Alaska. And we know this, this, this land bridge or this mass of land basically uh, came and went over the last several million years and often over the last several uh, tens of thousands of years. Ravens were evolving in Africa uh, prior to this time, from two to four million years ago, modern ancestors, ancestral raven forms were occurring there. And as did many songbirds, they spread throughout Europe and Asia uh, during that time. Uh, shortly thereafter, they gave rise to one new species, uh, not only the common raven, which occurs throughout the, the northern part of the range, but to the Canary Island raven, which is isolated on the Canary Islands. And it wasn't until about 2 million years ago that ravens first came across to the New World through the one of the first connections across Beringia. So the, the basic uh, mode of movement has been up to the north, over to the uh, east, and finally across into the, to the New World uh, via the land bridge. So about 2 million years ago, these ravens started to accumulate differences as the land bridge closed again with uh, receding with melting glaciers and increasing um, seawater levels that flooded the area so that now the old and new world were separate again for, for land birds anyway. And the common ravens on the new world started to, verge, started to diverge from those in the old world. At that time, they also gave rise to the Chihuahuan raven, which I, I suspect many of you are familiar with in, in um, the southwestern US. That is a very distinct species, behaves differently, sounds differently genetically, very different from the uh, common raven. That happened about a million years ago. So we had a process going on where the old world common raven and the new world common raven were starting to diverge over this period. They both gave rise to these new, new, new forms, the Canary Island bird in the old world, Chihuahuan bird in the new world, but the, the basic stock of the common raven was also diverging at this time and accumulating differences between the new and old world. And then ice ages reappeared and, and came again in the last several tens of thousands of years. And about 15 years ago, 15,000 years ago, sorry, uh, as Beringia was reformed, common ravens again came into the new world from the old world. Now remember, there was already some old world stock here. They were starting to diverge. They were on their way probably to speciating from the common raven that remained in the old world. Uh, but with this new influx of genes from the old world, that speciation process was stalled or reversed even. And now we see that the two forms, which we can identify genetically, and that's how we know kind of when they started to diverge and when they came back into the new world, um, they've, they've reversed that speciation process. And now those two forms freely interbreed and they are uh, viewed as a single species, although genetically still very distinct and even more distinct than the Chihuahuan raven is from the common raven. So that's a bit of the history. They came and went with the ice and the rising sea levels and the connections that those enabled between the old and new world. A little bit about their biology. As with uh, all corvids, ravens uh, form lifetime, lifetime um, pair bonds. They are, the pair bond is a strong unit within this uh, species, stronger than within most of the corvids, I would argue. Here you see a, a mated pair preening, allopreening one another in Yellowstone, and this is a common trait you'll see among crows in the city and, and ravens in the city uh, where, where you are at. But in addition to these mated pairs, which defend all-purpose territories, are, there are many non-breeding birds, and we call these a variety of things, uh, vagrants, non-breeders, um, immature birds, but they're basically birds that are of varying age. They could be 15 or more years old, uh, most of them are much younger, the first year or two of life. They do not have social status enough to, to claim and defend a territory and obtain a mate to do so. 
Uh, and so they roam around quite, quite widely. And we know uh, from work in Maine that they tend to attract one another to, to rich food sources. Like for example, in this image, uh, what you see is a, is a dead moose that a pair of ravens has found on their territory. Now that pair, that mated pair is gonna defend that with all their might. And they will keep other birds from accessing it until a group forms, at which time that group can overpower the defensive actions or just swamp the defense and they will all feed together at this carcass. So what we observed there was that a raven or two might accumulate at this carcass during the day. They would yell and, and make all kinds of noise to try to get access to that, which might attract a few more within earshot. And you'd have a small group accumulate, but they would have very little success eating with this territorial pair until they go back to their communal roost at night. And at night, ravens in, in Maine would, would roost in groups of around 100 and they would attract others from that roost to come with them the next day and join in the feast. That's a selfish move from the bird recruiting because now they can also access the food. So it looks to be quite cooperative, but in fact, it's a very selfishly motivated behavior. But it works out that the individuals that find food one day uh, are, may attract others to join them, whereas the next day, some other bird might find food and those that had found it previously would follow them uh, to the new food. And as far as mechanisms, what we learned there was that it seemed pretty simple. If you don't know where food is, hang out at the roost and follow those in the morning that are flying in one direction and, and you'll be led to that food. And if you know where food is, get up and, and go to it the next day and the others will come with you and you'll be able to overpower the birds that are defending it. But in Yellowstone and now increasingly across parts of the West, uh, that process might not work the same because we have wolves on the scene. And for example, here's, here's what's left of a wolf kill of a small elk in this case, uh, just a few hours after the kill was made. Most of the meat is gone and there are many other scavengers there like this bald eagle uh, that's on the carcass, as well as many ravens that are gathered around it within a few minutes after that kill is made. So we thought the exchange of information that we had documented at roosts in, in the east might not be playing out the same way here and we were intrigued to learn more. And in addition, as humans have dominated more and more of the landscape, other resources are available for ravens beyond just carcasses. Uh, here's ex some examples of those ravens begging from tourists, uh, gathering food from dumpsters, and wading in and fishing fat out of our wastewater treatment plants, which is a very common behavior of theirs. So we proposed to, to try to learn more about this and really understand the degree to which ravens use wolves, use people, how that varies with the variety of, of aspects of their uh, attributes and of the landscape that they live in. And I just want to point out our work supported by the University of Washington, the Max Planck Institute of Animal Behavior and the National Geographic Society. So let's, let me show you how we catch our birds because we need to catch and tag them to understand these things. We use a net launcher and you'll see in this video uh, that we attract birds into food. Here's, a, here's food that actually uh, wolves had provided for these birds and our launcher is here. When the birds are ready, in our mind, we fire the gun remotely. In this case, we were lucky enough to catch a couple of those birds. At that point, we bring them in, uh, cover their heads to keep them calm and place a radio transmitter on them. This transmitter is high-tech new sort of transmitter. You can see it's got solar panels on it so that they can last indefinitely as long as the bird doesn't damage them or they don't get covered up by their feathers. The, the sun recharges the batteries. The other important thing about them is that they take very accurate GPS locations of the bird where it's at, store that information and then upload it either when we encounter the bird with a, we can use a receiver to download the data or through these antennas it contacts the cell network, uploads the data to the cell network, and we can download it on our computer. So I've done a lot of telemetry over my career, and we used to have to chase after our birds and you know figure out where they were, where we were, to, to get a few points a day. Uh, we've gotten, we're almost at a million locations on the birds. We've tagged about 60 birds in Yellowstone now, and we get a um, hun hundred or more every day, and all I have to do is sit in my office, and they just come in.
So I've got a lot of collaborators in this work. Primary among them is Matthias Loretto. Matthias is a uh, Austrian who is now a professor in Germany. In fact, he is in Yellowstone right now, just got there since we opened up the borders again and is able to uh, go out and, and track our birds as well. Um, I have a couple of uh, colleagues that are undergrads at the university, Cameron Ho and Georgia Coleman, as well as the, the team of researchers at Yellowstone that work with wolves and, and pumas, Doug Smith and Dan Staler, and birds, Lauren Walker. So what sorts of things are we learning? First off, if we look at what the ravens used for food over the course of the first year after we tagged them. This is the pattern we see. There are some foods that are used uh, kind of at, at moderate to low levels throughout the year, like roadkill or wolf carcasses, or wolf killed carcasses, I should say, uh, and agriculture. There tends to be a bit of a peak in agriculture early in the year, and it's used more frequently than those other two foods, but pretty evenly throughout the year. In contrast, the use of um, the use of hunter provided gut piles peaks during the hunting season, as you would expect, and it becomes a very important resource. In January, uh, in February, uh, sorry, February and March, I should say, uh, when indigenous hunters are taking bison on the edge of the park, uh, our ravens are all there foraging with them. Likewise, in the autumn, as sport hunters are taking elk and deer outside the park, our ravens are all with those hunters. Other times of year, they're uh, early in the winter, they're at those waste treatment uh, facilities, either getting garbage or compost, or most frequently, the fat that floats up in our water treatment plants. And in the summer, they switch completely and they forage on dispersed natural resources. And in this case, in Yellowstone, this is primarily insects, everything from salmon flies as they hatch out along the river, all birds line up right with the fishermen and, and take those insects, or throughout the summer, um, they, they take small uh, rodents that are killed, ground squirrels that are killed on the road and are, that are very important to them. And they also flip bison patties and get insects, uh, insect larvae out of those patties, big grubs of beetles, and also lots of maggots from flies that are uh, infesting those patties. So they have extremely varied diet and it varies from season to season what they're eating. But note that many of these, agriculture, gut piles, waste, roadkill, those are all provided by humans, whereas a few of these are provided by nature. Well, let's look at the movements of, of the different uh, groups of birds now in Yellowstone. And, and when we think about breeding birds, they have a lot of constraints on their movements. They have to take care of young, like, like this parent's doing. These young are boisterous, they're hungry and they command the entire intention of our birds during most of the year. Here, for example, is one of our territorial birds that nested by mud volcano in, in Yellowstone, uh, this is the Yellowstone River. And um, it had an area that it occupied during May and August that was centered right around that nest. Far, the farthest it would get would be five miles or so from that nest. Almost all of those locations, so centered right there as it's taking care of, of its nestlings. And here they are, they, this, this pair in that year produced three uh, fledglings from a nest in this uh, lodgepole pond. It's a totally different story when, they, uh, when the um, breeders are done producing their young and the young are dispersing, so do the adults. Here's a, the territorial pair at its nest again where it was uh, prior to the uh, ending of the breeding season. And now instead of only foraging about 5.6 miles away from their nest, they're going 57 miles away from their nest. They are daily commuting over 50 miles uh, to attract two, two other resources to the north and west or, or here straight to the west. And those resources are human provided. One of the most important ones are hunters and the gut piles they leave at that time as we saw with that increased use of that resource. We expected uh, vagrant non-breeders to exploit these. I never expected a territorial bird to fly 50 miles one way every day back and forth to hit gut piles, but they, they do as this bird demonstrates, hunting areas here and here. And in addition, they're hitting dumpsters and water treatment plants as well that are in that general area. 
And it's not just this bird, it's every bird we've tagged makes use of these resources, whether they're territorial or not. And that really raises some interesting questions behaviorally that, that we're just starting to think about really. Again, here was that bird's nest. How does it know to go up here? I mean, this is to me quite fantastic because the day that hunting season starts, that bird starts going up there. It doesn't go there before that, but it knows when hunting season starts, maybe it hears the guns, maybe it knows that the season of the year to start heading that way, but it's very precise. And, and when it goes up here, there's food there to be had. And sometimes it headed over here to West Yellowstone. And again, a, a distance of about 50 miles. And occasionally then it would, would um, direct reckon or dead reckon from that area back up to this area. So it, it has knowledge of a huge, huge area here. And it either has that all as, as memory or it's following familiar associates from place to place as well, which we have some evidence of. Now, non-breeders don't typically commute like that. They just move from place to place in search of where the best food is. Here's an example of the longest, longest dispersal event ever recorded for a raven. One of our juveniles we tagged in the park here started moving to the north uh, into various mountain ranges in, on the flanks of the Rockies in Montana and then headed up to Canada where it lives to this day in more of an agricultural setting in the foothills here in Alberta. All the yellow dots along here are that bird using uh, human provided resources, uh, various um, uh, sewage treatment plants, agricultural settings, and the like. And the red points here are roosts that it uses on power lines. Um, so again, there's another resource we provide, not just food, but nest sites in, in non-traditional places like on power poles or roost sites, as is the case here. And while, while this bird was, was roosting in, in, on these power poles, it was in the company of about 5,000 other birds, other ravens. They were also nesting there, or sorry, roosting there. It's late in the day. All right, well, let's look at the movement of one bird over the course of the year. Again, just to give you a feel for how big of an area and to provide some scale here for you. Um, this is the, the edge of Montana, and this is all Wyoming. Yellowstone Lake, Grand Tetons, Yellowstone Park would basically in, include the area. Uh, kind of all this area here. And we caught this bird, Bernie. Uh, we didn't name Bernie, but the people that were working construction uh, on one of the roads in Yellowstone named him Bernie because he had a habit of following uh, the, the people that were stopped uh, at the traffic stops as the workers were paving the road. As Soon as the car stopped, Bernie would come and just, he and his mate would walk right down the middle of the road, right on the yellow stripes and beg from every car. And, and it was a pretty good strategy. He not only got food from the guys working there, but from all the cars that were stopped there. And, and when we caught him, it was right at the end of the construction season. And he had a very small um, home range at that point, just, just working cars. Uh, with hunting season started, he did just what you, we told you about the mud volcano bird. He went up to the north and, and west here to hit gut piles. Uh, during his first winter, he expanded a bit more, also heading over here towards Yellowstone. So this trajectory is very similar to the bird I just showed you. And right before the, this was the year of the park being shut down for the onset of the um, coronavirus. And he was traveling in this red area uh, right before the park was shut down. And we wondered what that might do to his behavior because we know he was quite a scrounger and begging from other people that now were excluded ourselves as well from the park. And the pink shows the expansion again over his really his entire range and even a bit further here to the east than we had ever recorded him once tourism was stopped in the park. And throughout the next summer, he, he's tended to establish a new area of activity quite a way south parallel with the, the Grand Tetons in this case. He returned back to hit the hunting grounds. The green dots here hit those hunting grounds again the next fall. So again, he's remembering where these places are, even though he had centered his, his activity another hundred miles further south. And he continues to move south uh, throughout that next year. So if we add that all up, just as a perspective for the kind of area that this bird has utilized, 525 mile perimeter, in an area of about 6,500 square miles, a huge area 
And, and he seems not only to use it, but to know it very well. Know where the food is and at what time food is in different places, how to adjust if food dries up, like with the um, closure of the park for the coronavirus. Well, what about some other individual strategies? Let's look how these birds use different uh, resources in the park. And first I'll talk about uh, some of the birds that use wolves and how, how frequently our birds use wolves. We saw on that first diagram that they use wolves at a low but consistent percentage if you average across all the birds that we're tracking. But some birds tended to use wolves much more. And this is a pretty common scene. Those of you who have been to the park uh, in the last decade or two, uh, I've certainly uh, probably seen wolves. And if you've seen a kill, you would have seen this sort of activity where in this case, a bison carcass freshly killed by this pack of Junction Butte wolves is being defended by the wolves, but the ravens and magpies sneak in, coyotes sneak in whenever they can when the wolves are uh, away from the carcass. And this had led to a lot of speculation in the popular literature. For example, Barry Lopez's book, where he thought that ravens uh, may actually lead wolves to their kill or to, to places where they could make a kill and certainly use their kill. Well, we certainly agree they use the kills. I'm not so certain. I'll give you a little bit of evidence that they might help wolves in some cases, but they play with them a lot. They, um, and they're viewed in high regard for this sort of interaction by uh, local people as well. There's a little bit of science that has been done on this relationship. And uh, what it shows is that again, Ravens are right there with wolves when a kill is made. They might be very dependent in some areas like on Isle Royale where David Meech studied uh, ravens and, and wolves, uh, that they may be completely dependent upon the wolves for their food there. I suspect they still were hitting humans there, but it's hard to tell until you have these transmitters like we have on them. And at the first uh, part in Yellowstone when, when wolves had just been reintroduced, uh, Dan Staler and Doug Smith with, with Bern Heinrich had noted that there was some situations where it appeared that ravens would uh, harass injured elk and that might attract wolves to it. And from Dan's work, uh, he, he quantified all the times he saw ravens under different situations. So here's the proportion of time that he saw ravens with wolves when they were traveling, resting, chasing prey, getting mice, all the activities together, and at a kill. And, and as we have seen and, and heard from others, they're always at a kill. And uh, about almost 90% of the time, there, when there's a wolf around, there's a raven around as well. That's not the case with respect to coyotes. They, they don't follow coyotes or, or, or interact with them much, only at the kill as a competitor. And in terms of others uh, kind of control elements on the landscape, much less. So they're certainly attracted to wolves. And in fact, uh, during our first year of study, the wolf team identified 204 wolf kills, and our birds were at 43% of those kills. Some of the kills, a couple of them, attracted a dozen of our tagged birds, but most of the kills had just a few of our birds at them. And some of our birds uh, really paid no attention to wolf kills during our, our first year of study. 30% were never observed at a known wolf kill, whereas 22% of them seem to pay a lot of attention and they were regularly uh, observed there. Some of them at five or more wolf kills uh, quite frequently. And those were primarily adults, the gray bar here, that lived in the Lamar Valley close by to where most of the wolf activity is concentrated in the winter. There were also some sub-adults involved in, in these uh, foraging on wolf kills, but none of our juveniles were, whereas juveniles tended to uh, use them infrequently or not at all. So we tend to have some specialization, maybe by birds that are, have the greatest access to wolves or those that are relatively dominant, like our sub-adult birds um, that, that can access those crowded situations, like I showed you on that slide with the bald eagle at a wolf kill. Well, here's kind of what happens at a wolf kill uh, from the time the kill is made in terms of number of ravens until it's, the food is consumed. What I've plotted here are the number of ravens and uh, as a function of time over four days. And the numbers that are in the little blue circles are the number of ravens that we counted at the kill at that time. When I first started observing the birds, I saw wolves and they had not made a kill. There was one raven with them. Uh, when the 
uh, elk, in this case, a bull elk was killed, there were four ravens with them at the kill. And that immediately increased to 15 over the next uh, hour or two as ravens were attracted during the day, not from a roost, during the day to this kill. They didn't feed much because the wolves were there eating and very defensive. And so their numbers dropped and, and rose again uh, the next morning, indicating there might have been some attraction from 15 at a maximum the day before to 23 the next morning, some attraction of birds from a nearby roost. But then the numbers just uh, fluctuate during that second day quite a lot as wolves chase or don't chase the ravens away. It eventually reaches a high of 33 ravens at this kill, drops down as night falls and the ravens go to roost and then gradually peters out the next couple of days as most of the food is consumed. So the point from this is that there's a lot of change during the day, increased uh, discovery or attraction to the sound of the kill uh, by the ravens that are fighting there, the wolves that are howling and, and behaving otherwise there. Uh, and there's perhaps some attraction from one uh, day to the from one day to the next. Another situation is is this, and this is common also that a kill is made at night and first thing in the morning. There the wolves are there, and maybe one raven is there in this case. Quickly four, then up to thirty three right away that first morning. Uh, so all the the birds that were going to find this kill basically did it that first few hours after it was made and after light uh, arrived. Their numbers remained at about that the next day and then gradually declined again as wolves consumed the food and as ravens consumed what was left. I'll come back to this kill and show you some particulars about individuals moving in and out of it as well. But the basic pattern is increase during the day, decline as food is eaten. And this is very different than Bern Heinrich and I and my wife Colleen observed in the woods of Maine. And what we observed there was a situation that's for example, for an elk, more similar to this pattern with a cow. And that is if you place a dead cow out in the, the woods of Maine, where they're not wolves, it lasts a long time. And initially there's very few ravens there, as I said with our roosting uh, slide, very few, mainly the pair and a few that are trying to get access until finally there's attraction from a roost and from one day to the next, a big jump, another big jump, another big jump as flocks are recruited in from nearby roosts to feed there. And then it declines as we saw. Same thing with smaller cars, as few individuals, big jump from one day to the next, and then a decline, but not big changes during a day. Well, let's look at that uh, bull elk over in Soda Butte Creek and see how the different birds that we had tagged in the area came into this kill. So uh, first off, the, the wolf kill is here. And we had four birds in the basic area. There was a, a non-breeder over here by Billings, another one in Bozeman, and two territorial birds in the Lamar um, and close by here in Soda Butte Creek. Um, this bird is territorial and has a home range centered here. This other one centered down here. Both of these birds were in the area uh, and came in um, immediately that first day the kill was made. So when the kill is made, the territorial bird here, the purple bird is right there in that morning, and so is the red one. Neither of those non-breeders is there. So within the first few hours after that kill was discovered, it was made at night. Uh, our two territorial, nearby territorial birds are there, and they're dominant at that carcass. The next day, the bird from Bozeman, for what we do not understand how, but all of a sudden flies 140 miles around past the carcass, back to the carcass, and feeds there uh, at the wolf kill that next day. Likewise, the bird from Billings, the next day on day four flies 100 miles in almost a straight line right to the wolf kill. And it flies over the highest mountains in Montana. Here, this is um, the Beartooth Plateau. Very high rugged terrain in the winter. There's, there's nothing going on up here. So this bird and the one that came from Bozeman apparently either have a regular habit of occasionally checking out the Lamar Valley for wolf kills, which uh, are not infrequent, or they got some signals from quite a distance away, either by the activity of people, wolves, other ravens, we don't know, uh, to, I, to alert them to the fact that there was an active kill for them to go and forage at. We know they didn't get information at the nearby roost because there was a communal roost just within a mile or so of this kill. 
And neither of our territorial birds were there, for example, the red and the purple, yet they were at the wolf guild. They were not at the roost. There were, however, several other birds at the roost, but only one of those, the one that was that came from Bozeman, went down to the kill from there. So again, roost may play some role, but we think it's fairly minor. We think instead that birds have patterns that they follow uh, to come in and check out these areas occasionally and probably cue in on, on signals from an immense distance. And what those signals are, we're hoping to figure out. If you've got ideas, I'm all ears. They also, some of our birds associated with wolf dens, and this had been reported uh, with, with birds scavenging from the dens or, or even playing with the wolves there and the pups. We didn't see much interaction, but if we look at where our ravens accumulated, uh, most of the ravens did not uh, visit a den at all, but a few visited one or two dens, and some of the dens had up to four of our tag birds at them. So this seems to be a relatively minor part of their um, of their foraging pattern. And in fact, you can see here with the distribution, all these points I, I should have mentioned on the previous slide for you, all the, all the little points or locations of our birds about every half hour and uh, the colors are different birds. Here's one of the dens that they utilized and you can see we had um, three of our birds there. A female that was breeding over here and when her nest failed, she came over and scavenged a bit around the den and two non-breeding males, which is, seems to be the more typical uh, birds that are utilizing these den areas. But there's lots of other use, lots of points concentrated away from the den. So, you know, hitting other resources, uh, for example, um, perhaps a wolf kill or um, other situations that they're exploiting much more so than they're exploiting this den during that same period of time. Well, what about wolves? Do they get anything out of this situation? As I said in the literature, uh, there's some suggestion. I've been getting a lot of phone calls from um, film companies that want to film this, you know, how do ravens bring wolves into kills? And I have to tell them, I don't think they do. <laughs> and you're, you're not going to get it on film if they do, most likely. And the reason I say that is from data such as this. And, and what you see here are two yellow balloons the yellows are places where we had a concentration of ravens and we did not, uh, and the wolf team had not identified that place as where the wolves had made a kill. And one of those over here, number 645, uh, was a place where we had our ravens, two of them. There was also a wolf from a nearby pack there at the same time from the time before and during the whole time that our ravens were there. So this suggested to us that this was a wolf kill made by the Cougar Creek pack uh, and our ravens were exploiting it and the, the wolf crew just didn't know about it. I mean, we don't know everything that's going on. Uh, and this was a situation where our birds alerted us to a place where there was a wolf kill that um, we just didn't know about. In contrast, at this same day, uh, there was this concentration of ravens here and there were wolves quite far away. Uh, that were not there yet. So there were already ravens, but no wolves. Over the next day, two of the wolves in that pack got a little closer, but the, and the ravens are still there. The reason I know that is because we've coated it yellow to indicate there's a group of ravens there. On day three, two days after we first had ravens there, finally, the members of the Junction Butte pack uh, of tagged wolves are there and presumably feeding with the ravens on a carcass that the ravens had discovered and the wolves had exploited that discovery. They're there the next day eating as well. And then they finally move off again uh, back to the east and south. So it looks to us like at this point, and there are still ravens here, I should say. So at this point, the, the ravens were there probably making a lot of noise, flying around. The wolves either heard that commotion or smelled the kill. It was probably a winter killed bison for as long as it lasted. And the wolves came in and used basically that resource. And then they were all gone the next day after. So we have several instances of this. Uh, and about half the time, 19 times, the wolves and ravens were there together like it was an undiscovered kill for us. And uh, 17 times ravens were there before wolves. So it suggests that there may be some um, I would say probably parasitism of information by the wolves of the raven, just like the ravens parasitize wolves 
uh, to take their and use some of their kills when they can. And in contrast, we never saw this at a cougar kill. So cougars are solitary, as you know, they cover up their food. They um, do not make a lot of noise around their kills and ravens do exploit them. They do find some of those, but they were never there before a cougar was. Wherever we had a cougar at a kill, ravens came after that. Well, let's move beyond the, the wolfers and look at some of the other strategies these birds um, engage in. And one of the most obvious and to be one of the most entertaining is begging. And you can see by this bird, this is a territorial bird uh, that lives by Tower Junction. If you've ever been there, you've probably seen this pair of birds and they approach cars um, absolutely without shame, look the drivers in the eye, give them a, a once over and just look plaintively and eventually they get food. This guy tossed that raven a ham sandwich right after I took this picture. But the ultimate beggar is one of our tag birds uh, that is called Steve. Well, it's called Steve, but once we did her DNA and discovered she was a female, we've changed her name to Stevie. In this photo, uh, you can see Molly in the background uh, who has trained Steve to ring a bell to get fed. Molly works at a nearby bar in Cook City, brings home roast beef on Wednesdays. Stevie's right there to take roast beef every Wednesday and, and other foods throughout the day. They were so afraid that this bird was going to break their window by the strong pounding for food that they were doing that um, they hung the bell out there for her to ring uh, and able to signal to them that she wanted food. And they've just reinforced this behavior, obviously. The interesting thing about this bird is that this bird was doing this before I tagged it. I had no idea about that. I caught the bird uh, very easily in Cook City, thought nothing of it except that it was a lucky day and um, tagged her, let her go. And uh, then I learned that the, the citizenry of Cook City was upset that their town mascot had been tagged and wondered what was going on with that. And I went and explained and they were happy to learn more about their bird, but she has a bit of a, a crippled foot and that's why they glommed onto her and adopted her as their, as their bird and they're very possessive of her. But fortunately, uh, I chose the right colors to put on her leg, blue and white, because Molly's husband is, a, is a, a graduate from University of Kentucky and that's their color. So otherwise he was gonna take the bands off and my transmitter off before I learned about their, their concern. Well, Stevie doesn't just beg. Here's the Cook City area where that photo was taken. She also covers an area of hundreds of miles, almost up to Bozeman and down to um, Cody, Wyoming frequently. She comes up and hits uh, carcasses and gut piles as the other birds do, but she spends a lot of her time here and she is not mated. She's probably because of her injury um, and she's um, got a good life and seems, seems very pleased with it. As we look deeply into her locations, I saw she, she hung out at some other places. Here's her activity around Cook City, but I noticed a cluster of points here around Kersey Lake up in the Beartooth Wilderness. And about that time, I got an email from a lawyer who has a friend who lives at a cabin up there. And he said, hey, I've got this friend who has a raven that comes visiting all the time. Do you know anything about it? And I said, well, I, I have an idea. So I looked under that cluster of points and here's his friend's cabin at the head of Kersey Lake. And we hiked in to, to meet the, what I presumed was gonna be a hermit living out here in the wilderness with a pet raven. And uh, we met the former Lieutenant Governor of South Dakota, who was a, had also adopted Stevie as, as his bird. So Stevie was working people all over the place and successfully getting handouts from all of them and changing their opinion about ravens, I would say in the meantime, into one that was quite positive. Well, ravens aren't only beggars, they're thieves. Uh, this is a shot from um, Grand Canyon, but they're known to open up uh, backpacks and other sorts of um, devices to get at food and, and rifle through all the contents there. Here's a bird digging out, looking for food in this pack. It's not gonna get any food this time, but I was intrigued and wanted to see uh, what I'd heard about them doing this on uh, to snowmobilers in the Old Faithful area. So we went into Old Faithful in the winter. Uh, we have a couple of our birds tagged there. Here's an aerial view of the, of the Old Faithful complex here, got the geyser basin, all the white area. 
We have two birds that are territorial there, two females that breed there. You can see they've divvied up that space pretty much half and half. They also commute over to West Yellowstone and, and further into Idaho. So they don't just use that area, but again, territorial birds moving quite long distances. And they beg from people, they steal food from them, but they aren't able to get into um, the snowmobile backpacks anymore. Snowmobiles used to have saddlebags that were Velcro or zipper, and the birds would get into those right away. And this is an example of our ongoing cultural coevolution with these birds, and that now all the snowmobiles have these locking hard shell compartments that the birds can't get into, in part because the birds were, were a problem for them. So humans reacted with that, and the birds have reacted as well. This area is a peck mark on the seat of this brand new um, skidoo that the ravens have ripped into and dug into the foam, probably in frustration of not being able to get into the back container here. And so now the ravens are waging war on the soft parts of the snowmobiles that they can get at. And, and I don't know what people will do next, but they will come up with something, I'm sure. All right, well, let me uh, get back to the, the first question, which was, uh, what about this increase? We can see it might be a problem for snowmobile operators, and, and certainly they view it as a problem uh, in the park. But what about the endangered species that also end up on the diet of a, of a raven? Um, with this increased numbers, as I said, the desert tortoise in your area uh, is an endangered species that ravens eat young tortoises. And um, that's been a, a issue. The issue is now raising itself with sage grouse and our attempts to conserve sage grouse where ravens prey upon some of the young grouse uh, and also with snowy plovers and other species of, of shorebird that nest on our beaches. And their young are also quite vulnerable to predation by this increasing number of birds. Well, the response to this has been to kill ravens. And this is the number of ravens our government kills every year from the mid 90s to the present day. We're killing about 10,000 birds a year, uh, really without, uh, without much effect. It's like killing coyotes. You can kill a bunch of them and there's still a bunch more ravens. From the data we've collected, we see that they're wandering widely. So knowing that you're getting the birds that are having an effect in one area is hard to say because those birds could have come from 50 or more miles away. Uh, and to utilize that place. We know that there are some bad ravens that, that may need control like this, but to just kill 10,000 a year, I think is pretty ineffective. And what our research suggests is that it's a much, much better solution and more sustainable one to deal with those resources that are around that are attracting ravens to those places. If you think back to those images of a raven commuting 50 miles one way to go to gutter, go to hunter gut piles or to go to a garbage um, transfer station, those are the places we should spend our efforts to educate hunters to either bury their gut piles, if that's a place that, that would be attracting ravens to where they might have an effect on another species that we're concerned about, or to even remove them. And that's been done with some success for California condors in, um, in Arizona and Utah. Otherwise, uh, getting Closing dumps, which has been done in a lot of places, armoring them with, with, plate, with um, either lasers or um, fencing and, and netting to keep the birds out. Removing the subsidy from the ability of the birds to utilize it will certainly have a big effect on where the birds occur and probably on that increase in their population as well. And it would be um, sustainable and it would allow the numbers of ravens and their prey to, to be in a much more um, typical uh, arrangement. So I would thank you for listening. Uh, I'm glad to take your questions. I saw a couple as I was talking, but I'm glad to take them afterwards. I'd also point you to our, our, um, our website, the Avian Conservation Lab at the University of Washington, where you can get our research papers. Uh, if you're interested in crow behavior and, and want to go out there and document it and, and have fun with it as an adult or especially as a kid, there's a free app we developed called Crow Scientist. If you wanna see where our ravens in Yellowstone are, there's a free app, Animal Tracker, uh, from the Max Planck Institute that you can see where our birds are at any given time. Thanks again, Serena, for inviting me and um, 
and for everybody for listening. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Marsleff. That was so fascinating. I thought it was just so interesting to learn about all these different behaviors that you've uncovered about these ravens, as well as, uh, of course, the relationships with wolves and people. Um, so thank you again so much for that wonderful talk. We did have a couple of people ask about uh, the, the gut piles and whether there is an issue with lead poisoning of ravens. Great question. Absolutely, there is. We suspect that some of our birds uh, did get lead poisoned from that. We know from other studies in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem where they basically use ravens as a sentinel to see the amount of lead that eagles uh, are getting. And they get quite a lot and it's tied exactly with the hunting season. So um, gut piles are an incredibly important resource for lots of scavengers. I mean, in your part of the world, California condors really depend upon those. And what we need to do is what you guys did in California, and that is outlaw lead ammunition for, for hunting. And um, that has not been successful nationwide. And the last place it's going to occur is Wyoming or Montana or Idaho. So it's an uphill battle, but um, a lot of people do use copper, but, but not everyone. All right, good to know. Um, and then uh, another question related to ravens and their ages. Um, at what age does a juvenile become a subadult? Yeah, just that's just our classification. We call them a juvenile during their first year of life. We can tell by plumage and mouth coloration uh, that they are still in that first year of life. When they go through their first molt, um, they, their feathers become a different color, darker. Uh, glossier and less worn. And their mouths, however, still retain some pink coloration inside of them, which is a sign of social subordination and, and young age. Typically, they go hand in hand in the wild. So we know those are, um, are uh, second year or older birds. Um, we just don't know beyond that. We can't age them beyond that second year of life. So we know they're not breeders because um, well, one, if we track them, we know they're not uh, tied to a nest. And two, they've still got that pink coloration in their, in their mouth lining, which indicates they're socially subordinate and probably unable to defend a territory yet. And then we also had a question that was actually about crows, but perhaps it also applies to ravens. Um, do they make different calls for different purposes too? Absolutely. The, the vocal repertoire of both of those species and really most of the, the corvids is incredibly varied. They have some easily discerned signals. When we studied uh, ravens in Maine, we had about 17 very distinctive ones, which you also hear everywhere. Um, you know, calls to defend territory, the kind of knocking and corking that they give, the calls to uh, beg for food, the yell like call or, or groveling kind of begging that they'll do when they're getting attacked. Um, a, a sound that sounds just like a sandhill crane when they're ready to attack, kind of the last warning. Uh, and then uh, kind of a clucking like a chicken when they're going after a predator. So those typical um, sounds are pretty easy to identify, but then within each one, they're graded in intensity, they're individually distinct, and they're probably context specific. So Anybody who's ever studied corvid vocalizations gets frustrated quickly because of that complexity. You can tell the basic, you know, words, so to speak, but how the sentences go together, we don't know. Wow, that's really interesting. That could be a whole nother talk just about corvid communication. Um, and then uh, related to how um, ravens are really good at uh, I guess, exploiting um, backpacks and snowmobile packs. Um, is there a way to do some kind of taste aversion as a way to deter ravens? Yeah, there is. Uh, unfortunately, it's not as easy as with mammals because birds are not sensitive to hot pepper and uh, hot sauce that we can use on squirrels and things. But taste aversion works well on corvids. It's usually done with an emetic um, that the bird ingests and then it, it gets sick and they have a um, one trial learning of a conditioned taste aversion. Just like we have when we get a bad meal at a restaurant, we tend to avoid that place. They will do the same. And that would be a way to keep them out of 
desert tortoises, which is being ex explored right now to try to use those techniques and, and other sage grouse areas and things like that. Oh, interesting. So um, one question is, does the raven and wolf connection occur in European folklore? In his ring cycle, Wagner has the god Wotan get compared to a wolf, and Wotan uses ravens to spy on the world for him. Yeah, and, and same in the North mythology. Uh, Thor was informed daily by two ravens. So yes, that, and that relationship is strong in European literature. And the connection, but the modern connection between wolves and ravens, of course, has been frayed there, much as it was here with, with our killing of wolves. But in Poland and the Alavesia is a primal forest in Poland. Uh, wolves and ravens interact there just like they do in Yellowstone. Yeah. Wow, really interesting. Uh, and then uh, related to finding gut piles or kills, could ravens pick up cues from other birds like eagles and vultures? Yeah, I think they pick up cues from magpies first. Magpies are always the first into a kill because they have a good sense of smell and in a pretty local area. And, I, and ravens, when they see magpies, they come in for that. They really are attracted when an eagle comes in for sure. And that's always a good sign for us if we're trying to you know, see our birds or catch them. If we have an eagle or a coyote there, they're much bolder and willing to come in. Uh, but they're very hesitant initially. But if a wolf has made the kill, there's no hesitation, they're right there. If you were to put out food, they would. They could wait days before they would touch it because they just don't trust it. But the wolf is a very trusted provider in this case. Wow, I never would have thought. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then uh, you had also mentioned at the end um, about the GPS data and someone wanted to know if that data is publicly available. You mentioned Animal Tracker, was that where people could see it? Yeah, on Animal Tracker, you can see where the um, where our birds are at the latest time, basically. A little bit delayed from, from absolutely current time, but just by a few hours. Uh, the other place to, to get the data is through, the, um, through a website called MoveBank. And that's a repository for all kinds of telemetry data from studies all over the world. And our data is housed there. And you can view it. You can't download it and use it unless uh, you work with us to do that. So, you know, that's those those kinds of data sharing are there for people to utilize. And if they've got other ideas and things to think of to work with the people who are collecting the data to to investigate those and, and share that information for sure. Nice. I'll be sure to send out links to those and a follow up email to everybody who registered. So thank you for that information. Uh, and then another question we had was, um, do parents recognize their offspring in later seasons or um, do siblings recognize each other? Yeah, that's a great question. We don't know. Um, I never thought there was much association between uh, birds once they, they leave the territory. And the adults are very aggressive and kick their young out of the territory after about a month to six weeks uh, after they leave the nest. And we were surprised and we're just starting to get a feel for it that some of the birds we captured together uh, are seen then together at gut piles 50, 60 miles away that aren't mated individuals, but they happen to be where we caught them uh, foraging together at a sewage plant, for example, in the park. And they show up together at this gut pile and then they're together at another gut pile. So they, there's some association there and there's there seem to be some um, regular associations between some individuals that we've tagged, even among mated birds and, and unmated birds or between just unmated birds. Whether they're parent and offspring, sibling, we don't know, but we do have blood samples and we will be able to look at some of that later once we establish this kind of pattern of association, we can then look at blood samples and see are they more closely related than, than you would expect by chance. <clears throat> and then related to mated individuals, and you did talk about this a little bit in the beginning, um, the question was, do ravens mate for life or is it seasonal? And how long do juveniles hang out with the parents? Yeah, so juveniles are really just there for a month or so after they leave the nest. Once they become um, able to feed for themselves, the parents kick them out. They don't want anything to do with them at that point. 
um, and they're off on their own and they're wandering like that one of ours that ended 700 kilometers north up in Canada. Uh, as far as their pair bond, it is permanent. Uh, they are together every day throughout the year. They are preening, they are defending their space, they are foraging together at, at food, wherever it may be. Um, when one dies, which several of ours have, they've been immediately replaced by another bird. So it's not like they, uh, they mourn the loss for a long period of time. They've got business to get to, to keep the territory, to reproduce. And they, there are a lot of, as we've seen, a lot of unmated birds in the system. And those vie for and are eventually selected by the, the bird that was on the territory that, that survived as a new mate. Oh, that's awesome. That's really interesting info. Uh, and I'm sure that would change some people's feelings towards ravens if they knew that too. Yeah, um, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So I think that was the last question I'm seeing for now. So thank you again, everybody for attending. And thank you, Dr. Marsliff. Is there anything else that you want to say to everyone who's still attending uh, before we sign off? I would just say, I know many of you are living around crows and ravens. And if you're in the San Francisco area, for sure, you've got both. If you're in the greater Western part of the world here, you, you probably have both. And I would enjoy them and get to know them, get to know their differences. They're very different uh, behaviors and social structures between crows and ravens. And you can see a lot of this same sort of interaction, maybe not with a wolf uh, in your backyard, but certainly um, you can see a lot of interaction between these birds and other predators and prey. And if you get a chance to go to Yellowstone, boy, don't miss the Lamar Valley. Get out there and see the wolves and, and see the ravens interacting with them. It's quite, quite exciting. Awesome. Thank you so much again, Dr. Marslev. I know I will for sure be spending a little more time observing some of our local corvids. So again, thank you for that wonderful presentation. And thank you everyone again for tuning in. I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your evening.